Right, mic is hot. Hello, and welcome to episode two of series four of the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown, and I am the editor at Guns on Pegs. I'm joined, as usual, by the managing director of Guns on Pegs, Chris Horn. Chris, how's it going? Still no baby. <laughs> no, very, very good, George. Uh, b- baby's due on Monday, so we've snuck this one in. I have a feeling, well, I'm kind of hoping this is the last recording before baby, because I don't <laughs> think it's all getting a bit too uh, too much. No, Flo can't really move. So, uh, yes, uh, very exciting times. Uh, it sort of feels like that sort of, uh, I imagine if I'll come down to earth with a bang shortly, but it feels like that sort of end of term feeling before school you know at at Christmas uh from school where something's about to happen it's all about to change but yeah very exciting yeah very very exciting very exciting but um Chris since we're squeezing an episode in uh let's crack straight on with it and uh why don't you tell us about our guest for this episode so um our guest today is an incredibly active man when it comes to conservation most importantly probably but also shooting and many other activities um our guest is the fourth Earl of Swinton He owns the 20,000 acre Swinton estate, which includes 8,000 acres of Heather Moorland. He's chairman of the Moorland Association. Uh, Swinton is home to E.J. Churchill's northern base. Um, Swinton has a hotel and a cookery school. Uh, He's president of the Yorkshire Dales Rivers Trust. He's chairman of the CLA Forestry and Woodlands Committee. The estate is also home to Marina Gibson's fishing school. It has a Birds of Prey centre. I mean, honestly, the list goes on. This is like quite some intro. A massive, huge warm welcome to Mark Cunliffe Lister. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, delighted to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at my uh, drink and wondering when I can open it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that in a minute, Mark. Uh, just to reiterate what Chris said, thank you ever so much for joining us. It sounds like you've got plenty going on. So uh, it's great of you to make the time. But I wanted to ask, um, of all of those things that Chris has just mentioned, which is the one thing that you're most passionate about, if you can choose one? Um, really, I mean, it's, 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 it's a combination of the, the, the various attributes. I mean, I was so fortunate to have taken on Swinton Estate. My family um, bought it in the 1880s. And so we've been here, sort of fifth generation now, running the estate. And it's just a wonderful. I mean, it's a, just a true sporting estate. It's, it's got everything, as you say, from the, from the fishing to the shooting, the various combinations of shooting from the, the grouse up on the moors to the, the high pheasants, partridges to duck. It's just, just got it all really. So I've grown up here just enjoying it all and it's just trying to make sure it's still there for the next generations. And uh, that's part of why, why I think I've joined various bodies to, to keep that all going. Fascinating. So is the, is the direct answer to George's question then being in the grouse bat? <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that's a tr- truly special place because it's it's a it's an environment that you don't come across that often and you know, what is it is about uh, on the Moreland Association we've got 150 members a- across England and Wales and so yes there aren't that many of us around and it's it's, it's a lovely lovely place to be yeah we're definitely going to get on to that in a bit yeah but I can tell Mark that you're itching to to get into your drink so um why don't you tell us what's that you're drinking uh, so I've got a bottle of Thiexton's XB here, um, brewed in Masson. Uh, we're very fortunate in Masson to have two breweries. So I must mention the other one, which is Black Sheep Brewery. Uh, but I have to admit, that I do have a slight personal favourite towards Thiexton's. So you get the Thiexton's Best Bitter, which is a lovely quaffing ale, but XB just has a little bit more kick to it. And so, yeah, it's quite nice to, quite nice to enjoy that, which I, I certainly will be. Is Theakston's your preference over the two breweries, or can you not say? <laughs> uh, it'd be difficult, yes. Yeah. So I'm not, not, I'm not normally allowed to say on the uh, in the media, but I do have to say Theakston's does does come slightly above Black Sheep for me. So. I, really, I had a Black Sheep on one of our episodes a while back, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. So it did get a mention. I think Swinton got mentioned during that, but um, yeah, very good choice. George, what do you want? Well, it, uh, as you know, normally I would have a whiskey, but inspired by Sam Carlyle last week drinking his uh, Damson Gin Negroni, I nipped over to my mum and dad's house this afternoon and raided my dad's uh, cellar for a bottle of his Damson Vodka. It's the 2020 vintage, uh, and it is really, really good. It's sort of sweet, and it's got that kind of dark purpley colour, and it's just really good. 
on its own nice on its own in a glass yeah good. yeah perfect and uh the first time he's going to find out that i've nabbed a bottle is when he listens to this episode which could be in about <laughs> a year's time <laughs> exactly yeah what we'll do is we'll, we'll put it out for a bit then we'll delete it so he never actually knows <laughs> <laughs> what have you got chris um, so I have a, a beer from a brewery which I've had a beer from before. It's from Badger Brewery uh, down in Dorset. And it, I've got the Cranbourne Poacher. And this probably is out of all the beers in the world. Couldn't really be more on point for the podcast. Uh, it's a rich and fruity ruby ale. But as you remember from the, the I, th- I think it's the Fly Fisherman, the one I had before. That's right. Um, it's got a little message on the back. And uh, I'll read it out to you. Uh, so on the back of the Cranbourne Poacher, it says, they say there's no such thing as a free meal. But as, you'll, as you wind your way through wooded hills towards the tiny village of Cranbourne, you might chance upon a charming rogue who says differently. For years, the Cranbourne poacher has roamed these parts, outwitting both authority and prey in pursuit of pilfered plums and a pheasant for his pot. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. On very point good. for the pod. Yeah, very good. <laughs> pilfered plums, eh? Yeah, sounds like you, George. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right. So, Mark, the way we like to to really get things going with these uh, episodes is um, with a little bit of listener correspondence. The first segment is called Whose Bird Is It Anyway? And it's where we ask our listeners to send in their shooting quandaries and queries and dilemmas. And we, between us, will try to resolve them. Uh, This one comes from a young gun who had a nasty experience that I imagine is one that lots of younger shots have had. Um, let's call him Eugene. Uh, and he writes, On a recent partridge shoot in the Cotswolds, I was at least half the age of the rest of the guns. After a pretty terrible first drive, I eased into the second drive after some lubrication at Elevenses. After the second drive, one gun was complaining to me about the chap who was back gunning, who had been shooting fairly low birds. This chap in question attends the shoot every season. I'm not sure if the shoot captain witnessed his low bird shooting. The third drive was waterfowl, which went without a hitch, and we'd pretty much shot the bag. We therefore had a pretty quiet last drive of some traditional partridge over a hedgerow where all the guns were at the bottom of a small hill. Due to the lower number of birds on the last drive, all the shots were watched eagerly by the rest of the line. The last shot of the drive was with Mr. Low Shot himself, All of the guns and the shoot captain witnessed him shoot a bird no more than about six feet off the ground, clearly towards the beating line. I know I should have said something, but being young enough to be the gun's grandson, I felt like I couldn't say anything. I also didn't want it to lead to awkwardness at the post-shoot hospitality. How should I have approached this? Should I have spoken directly to the gun, or should I have brought it up with the shoot captain, bearing in mind that he appeared to be fairly well acquainted with the gun in question? So this is a classic, isn't it? I mean, yeah. we've absolutely all been here. <laughs> Unless you've only been out on one day. I, I reckon if you've been out on two days in your life, you've seen this once. <laughs> I agree. Um, right, Mark, straight to our guest. How do you handle a low, a, a low shooting gun? What's your usual tactic? Yeah, well, you've got a couple of things here. You say, yeah, it's sympathies of the poor young gun who's out there sort of trying to trying to enjoy the company of everyone else so yeah i'd have thought the, the best idea is, is that if anybody's ever uncomfortable in the shoot as you say some songs that, that should be identified at the beginning of the day as we do on ours who, who you come and speak to if you've got any problems so you just go and speak to them right say to going directly to the gun themselves and say you think they're out of order would be quite harsh but I, it's, it's difficult i mean yeah that uh, you get people who take low birds. I mean, so you can take safe low birds. A low bird, just taking a low bird doesn't mean you're unsafe. But clearly, if, if you're as it, on that last drive, they're pointing the gun in the wrong direction, then, then that's clearly out of order and needs, needs looking at. But uh, it's a difficult one because as people get older, it's you, you never know um, quite quite when your time might be up as a shooter. And uh, yeah, I've had various old sort of syndicate members who are lovely to be out, but it's... Uh, the safety has to come first in the end, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a shame. I do think it's particularly tough if you are significantly younger and therefore presumably less experienced than the the person who's doing what they shouldn't be doing. I think probably lots of young guns have maybe shot at the odd bird that maybe they shouldn't have done, getting overexcited. But if the if the gun is 
theoretically more experienced than you, you're never quite sure how they might take it, being told that they're in the wrong by some whippersnapper. You, you, I mean, you definitely can't be... You can't... <laughs> I remember this growing up. I was lucky enough to be out with my dad and my grandpa a few times with some old boys in in, in syndicates that they shot in. And you know, there's absolutely no way as a young gun you're going anywhere near this. You've, as Mark says, you've got to, if there's a bit of uh, protocol in place where you can go straight back to the shoot host. I mean, it kind of frustrates me when shoot hosts don't spot this. You know, as a host, what else are you doing? Like you're watching the line, surely. <laughs> um, well, presumably shoot- he was watching the screamer going over the other end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so, so that's, that's always the problem is I suppose if you're a shoot host you're shooting yourself it's, it's hard to to see what's going on so it depends whether you're just there hosting or shooting yeah, yeah. have you had some awkward ones of these Mark have you had to have you had to pull up a few people who really should uh, know better uh, well yeah probably one of the most awkward is my uncle himself as I say it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> knowing, knowing when someone someone's time has come and he, he was doing well, he was, yes he was back gunning and really he's just uh, the, the team are saying that this is just out of order. He's just can't can't get the the gun high enough, and it's just so. Yeah, it is it's, it is always a difficult one, and uh, you, but you, you, at the end of the day, you have to you have to say something because if an accident happens and you, you didn't say anything, then it's kind of yeah, you're going to always regret that. Yeah, I I think if you're a young if you are a young shot and you're listening to this, please don't worry. I think that. Not saying something is much worse. I mean, can you imagine if you didn't say something and something did happen? That would be quite very, difficult to Very, very good point. Yeah, really good point. And yeah, I think, you know, like you say, it's much better to go to the shoot captain than to try and bring it up personally because it's a very different experience having the shoot captain come up to you and say, you might want to just think about taking some of the slightly better birds that I'm showing you today yeah. rather than you bowling up as a youngster going god that was a bit low wasn't it and i've got another a bit of advice actually don't ever frame it as your opinion just say that the person who taught me to shoot told me i should never shoot birds that low <laughs> <laughs> and then it's either your dad or whoever whatever instructor and stuff so you, yeah. you then don't look like it's your opinion but <laughs> but it, i mean it's also it's a it's a lot more common than than you might suppose isn't it yeah and, and, and then twice to me we obviously get it more on the grouse where it's not not a, a low bird because obviously all the grouse can be low but it's just that dangerous shot and there's been quite a lot of work done i mean now you know, i remember the days you go out shooting grouse and there were, there were no safety sticks or anything so you wouldn't be given any guide as to what was a safe or an unsafe shot and you'd somehow be expected to know but now luckily most of the things you've got proper safety measures in place and it's a lot clearer as what is a an unsafe or a safe shot so Hopefully, that you shouldn't be left in that doubt, and people, you can be clear to somebody that that was an unsafe shot. That is a nerve wracking situation. I've never shot grouse without butt sticks, but mm. the idea of being around someone who's swinging through the line, there are no sticks, that fills me with horror. I mean, that yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd miss everything. I'd just be looking right or left the whole time rather than where they were coming from. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that was it. I mean, you go back a couple of decades, and that, that was how it all was. So it's so amazing how the Perhaps there weren't more accidents in those days, but everyone kind of knew what, what was a what was a safe and an unsafe shot. But was, I yeah, kind of think that everybody should everybody when they're learning to shoot should have a father's advice tattooed on their forearm, just so <laughs> that they can, if they're ever unsure, they can just look at it. Oh yeah, swing not across the line. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, look, I hope we've given some uh, good feedback for for Eugene, as you've called him here, George. Um, I I feel for him. Um, definitely been there. I'm sure we've all been there. Uh, but yeah, shoot host straight away, quietly, as discreetly as you can. And then the shoot host job is to do exactly what shoot host should be doing. At uh, what point do you think the shoot host kicks them off the shoot? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how low it was there and then theatrically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is a tough one. Here, yeah. I mean, I think there's probably a strong possibility. You hear quite often about people people being ticked off or, you know, politely requested to maybe shoot them uh, with a bit of sky behind them and them basically throwing their toys out the pram and, and storming off. Well, I won't be spoken to like that. I've been shooting for 40 years, blah, 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 all that stuff. And off they go in a bit of a huff. Mark, have you ever had to send someone home during the day? Uh, no, no, fortunately not yet. Um, but <laughs> yes, there's, there's been a few yellow cards. But I, that's the sort of system I use. I haven't, haven't got the red card out yet, but uh, yeah. 
<laughs> Very good. Right, so Chris, um, have you got an unpopular opinion for us? I do indeed, George. Um, so this unpopular opinion comes from Nicholas, and, and I've named him this week because I never get to name them. So uh, he writes, I don't think there's a proper shooting man out there who relishes high birds. Short and simple. It's certainly an interesting one. I think there's a couple of definitions we need to get straight first. Uh, I agree with you. And I'm going to guess that, well, we've got to define proper shooting man. And then we've got to talk about high birds. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Right. I don't think there's a proper shooting man out there who relishes high birds. Mark, is there anything that springs to mind straight away in that comment? Um, I mean, yes, you're always going to feel daunted by them. But yes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, because of, yes, I mean, and, and when you get a high bird, there's, there's nothing like the buzz and the remembering, the, 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 your, your, you call it back, your, your, your bathtub bird or isn't it? Yeah, you, yeah. you sit there thinking, I, I remember that one. So, um, yeah, gosh, no, I relish the challenge. I, I think sometimes, yes, we all go on about high birds too much and, and um Obviously, clearly, yeah, the, the sort of weaning factor and things like that is, is comes into it. But in terms of relishing it, yes, now I'm sure you'd be looking forward to the challenge. So, so this is it. So he's saying, I don't think there's a proper shooting man who relishes high birds. What he's saying is actually, if you're a proper shooting man, it sh- it's, you shouldn't be out doing high birds. But what do you think he's getting at here, George? My suspicion is that there's maybe a hint that he thinks that high bird shooting is really a kind of showing off exercise. I shot one that was 65 yards away. You know, it you it's it's for the the kudos or whatever of being able to say that you went to shoot x or y and and he's probably not wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely if you hit one you look around to check everybody else is watching, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean I do that on our little partridge shoot at home where none of them are more than about 25 yards up. So <laughs> <laughs> so, so therefore by what you've just said, he's suggesting that a proper shooting man, it's got nothing to do with the quality of the kill. It's got the sort of one for the pot type harvest nature. And therefore, it, who cares? About oh, so do you think he meant by proper shooting man? Do you think he means trousers held up with string? <laughs> Is that you've got an image of the proper shooting man in your head? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, ancient tweed, full of holes, battered old hat, you know, wellies that are only just sticking together that kind of practically a poacher is that what well, you're saying I, I i haven't got that in my head mark what who, what would you say a proper shooting man looks like well yeah it's it, it, i mean the, the um it's hard to say isn't it i mean there's the, the, been brilliant i mean things like ej church you mentioned earlier, I mean, the success has been i think of shooting recently it's been getting various different people to come shooting so that, that, that there's yes there's those people who've grown up with shooting and maybe that's what this person's referring to and sort of have a decorum and, and sort of know how to but uh, but uh, it's great you see, you see all sorts of people enjoying shooting whether the first time or something like that and they're there for, for every reason i think possibly the high bird does get too much prominence and that this is supposed to be the the ultimate whereas you can have a, a great challenge on anything be it a sort of you know, curling bird or just um, something coming dashing through quickly or so it doesn't doesn't have to be a high bird, and obviously, as I say, the, the wounding side does at times gets a bit bit problematic. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think anybody who's out there enjoying any aspect of shooting is a proper shooting person. To me. Well, that's it. Yeah, I I'm with you because I kind of think right. I relish a high bird. It's not the be all and end all, and I hate wounding them. I absolutely is nothing worse than wounding a bird. Right. A nice clean kill and obviously if that bird is really high and it's a nice clean kill then it doesn't get any better in my opinion but i'd much rather shoot a nice low bird clean in the head than wound a high one but you know we were shooting together the other week chris and i know that you're just as capable of wounding a lowish bird as you are a high one <laughs> <laughs> couldn't resist could you george not at all i mean the opportunity was there <laughs> so what I, I, so... I, i've seen chris shooting i, I can vouch that's not true <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> there we go, the guest. Uh, so uh, he's basically saying, I'm not a proper shooting man, which I definitely take offence with, uh, because I think to be a proper shooting man, if I was to try and summarise what a proper shooting man would look like, in my opinion, it'd be someone who appreciates and understands, most importantly, all the various aspects of shooting and the, the sort of the pros and the cons and the and the, and the positives and the, and the negatives and all that sort of stuff and, and weighs it together. But then also 
shoots well cleanly and and within their own uh you know within their own um abilities i think it's probably the best way of putting it that would be my definition of property shooting man anyone want to improve on that no i mean it's, it is an interesting point do you bring back in the, the old game license or, or, or some kind of shoot something that shows people have got a knowledge of what they're shooting at and have got the the ability to do it i mean they have it on the continent where it's, it's like a driving test or something you, you do the theory showing you've got the understanding of what's what shooting's all about and then you go and do a practical at a shooting ground or something so you can actually pull it you can hit a clay or do something and not complete them up it so and I, I think i mean that that to me then defines that you you've got an interest and you've got the skills required and then, then you're, you're you're a proper shooting man sort of thing so there is some reason to do that it's quite how that'll ever come about i don't know but there's a de- definitely a debate going on at the moment as to, to how we can do that yeah it's fascinating and 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 they do that very well in germany don't they but yeah, I, exactly. my, I'm immediately thinking of the downside. And for me, the biggest downside is actually something you've already alluded to, which is that by putting in barriers to entry, you're decreasing the number of participants. And I think the number of participants in game shooting in the UK is actually one of the strongest elements about it, uh, as you alluded to with, with, with EJ Churchill at, at Swinton. Um, uh, it's a such a fine line, isn't it? To get that right is going to be tricky. Well, going back to to, to the, the whose bird is it anyway? How many experienced, so called experienced game shots would fail? Well, it's like dri- the driving test, isn't it? Can you imagine if oh, everyone God. back into the driving <laughs> test? <laughs> yeah, I got, got got my son going through one at the moment, and I'm not much help to him. I must admit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's as important a point as someone coming into it. I mean, I was having a conversation in the pub last night with someone who was thinking about taking UK citizenship, and the test and the, and the questions that are involved. And again, we'd all fail that. Oh yeah, because you've got to know who died in 1974 on Coronation Street or something, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or all the Spice Girls' real days or something. Don't you? <laughs> That's that's a much better question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I won't I won't put you on the spot and I'll try and answer. That. <laughs> so do, you, do we feel like we've answered that that unpopular opinion? I think we probably have. Well, I think it's unpopular. Hmm. No, I, but I think I can understand what he's getting at, but I think he's taken it a bit too far. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't think I think I think even back in cave times, getting your whatever from a bit further than oh, what you close. think when they were out spearing mammoths, they all went back and told stories about how far away they were when they chucked their absolutely <laughs> if, if if one of them launched it from like further than the other one and they got it they talk about that more than the guy who did it from I, a bit closer. i just got a 30 yard mammoth <laughs> <laughs> definitely right good we've settled that one excellent right so nicholas and eugene and of course you mark uh, are now members of the most noble order of the garters and will shortly be in receipt uh, of your very own set of the very exclusive guns on pegs podcast shooting sock garters uh, if you too have a shooting confession, quandary or query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with, or you've got an unpopular opinion uh, and you'd like a set of garters, do drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. Right, Chris. So just quickly on the garters, if that email says, can I buy some? The answer is no, they're not for sale. <laughs> if the email says, can I have some for a charity auction? The answer is yes, with a thousand pound minimum reserve. Okay, there you go. <laughs> just, just to clarify, we're all for no, making. I'm, so I'm not allowed to resell mine then. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> o- only for charity. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, right. Quick reminder: uh, we've got our Guns on Pegs podcast shoot day at the end of January, um, and we're recording this episode two hours after the last one was made available and we've already filled a few pegs so basically i cannot guarantee at all that of any availability by the time this goes out but i'm sure there'll be a few pegs but get in touch if you're interested um but don't forget it's only open to members of the order of the garter so you've got to send in a quandary query dilemma unpopular opinion something else uh that will make it onto the pod in order to join us on the shoot day it's the 31st of january Bag is totally unknown. It's walk one, stand one. There's 20 guns. It's at Stockton, run by Barney Stratton. It's going to be awesome fun. We're staying over the night before. A real good laugh. I genuinely cannot wait. Uh, And uh, George, remind me of the price. I think we said £350, didn't we? I I think it's £350. I think. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good deal, whatever it is. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So that includes uh, dinner the night before, a few drinks, and uh, some and shooting, some and less I- or fewer birds. Oh, and um, I haven't told you, uh, Wild and Game. You know the awesome pasties. Oh yeah, uh, the, the game pies and everything. They're bringing on a whole big spread for the day as well. Oh, amazing! And I'm fairly certain there's some drink turning up from someone for the night before or after. I can't. And there's there's quite a lot of people chipping into this, by the way. It's becoming a thing. <laughs> Excellent. I like to hear that. Yeah. Good. Right. So, Mark, um, I always think it's nice to get a feel for our guests kind of shooting hinterland. They're shooting history. So I was wondering if you can tell us uh, what was the first game bird you ever shot? Can you remember where you were and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, sure, everyone can remember the first one. Uh, so for me, it was uh, I was taken out by my father to go along by the river to go and shoot a duck. Uh, so I had the uh, the old family bolt action four ten. <laughs> so I can never understand why, as a kid, you're given this gun. <laughs> exactly. Can't hit anything. <laughs> takes forever to load. Anyway, so I had it already, and he'd given me a little bit of a lecture. He said, "Right, we're going to go out and shoot the duck off the." the the river and he said uh, make sure you shoot the drake not the duck because hopefully the duck can have the eggs and, and don't and don't leave leave her be so anyway he went out and sure enough two two duck got up and it was pretty obvious which was the duck which was the drake i fired and uh, the duck fell down so uh, i wasn't then sure whether to own up to the fact i was aiming at the drake but was so far behind it i'd hit the duck or whether it's just to keep quiet and to take, take the acknowledgement that i've actually shot something so uh, I still I can't quite remember what I did decide at the time. Yeah, that was my so very true. first, very first bird I shot. <laughs> so I could my, my um, on my first ever shoot day. It wasn't my one, wasn't my first bird because my first bird was actually a hen pheasant. But on the next drive, exactly the same thing happened to me. Four duck came over. I was aiming at the one at the front, and the one at the back dropped. <laughs> <laughs> And and our dad was like, "Great shot, great shot!" And obviously, you just don't know what to say because it's exactly <laughs> not what you were hoping for. <laughs> I'm glad it sticks so fondly in your memory, and you can reel it off instantly. That's that's yeah. that's always a good sign, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and like, but yeah, so my first first grouse is always one to remember. Oh, uh, go well. on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was just up on, on one of the drives at Swinton, so uh, I, I remember which, exactly which drive it was. So yeah, that was great. Yeah. So there's so much going on at Swinton. Um, <clears throat> you must be an absolute dab hand at, in most forms of shooting. Um, I've alluded to it already, but which, which is your favourite? Um, to be honest, the, the, uh, I really hark back to the days when we used to do something called the walking days. So it was in um, October half term. So you'd have the, the, the guys in the syndicate and then us as the young kids on the block uh, would come back from school and half term we'd all cruise up to Swinton and uh, you basically go out and you'd join the beating line and just walk up the moor edge so you never knew what was going to get up in front of you anything from a grouse a partridge a pheasant a rabbit I mean how we never had an accident I don't know dogs running everywhere Um, but we managed to keep ourselves in a pretty much in a line and then the the guys would be either in a line of butts or behind a wall somewhere and uh, yeah, it was it was just magical, and then you'd perhaps go for a, a duck flight in the evening, and all meet up in the pub or for a meal meal at the end of the day. It was just just brilliant. Yeah, proper species day. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that actually. But then again, I say this about every form of shooting. You can't really <laughs> think about one; you can't really beat it. No, no, they, they all have their highlights, and uh, yeah, yeah. So, great. so it it sounds to me like uh, during lockdown you could have actually done that. Then is that what you went out and did half the time? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, we did, did, did some walked around, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there, there, was, there, was, there was plenty of pheasants out there, weren't there? They, they still needed, uh, yeah, given November and January were all shut down. So it was, uh, yeah, taking the kids out, having a bit of fun, yeah. I, one of the things that struck me when Chris was reeling off all the different things that go on at Swinton, um, then it must be a huge operation. And, of course, one of the things that we talk about all the time in shooting is is how many people... Uh, how many people's livelihoods it supports or or actually is their livelihood. So how many people at Swinton have you got working sort of directly involved in the shooting side of things? Um, so in terms of directly involved in the shooting, so we've got five keepers. So we've actually just gone through a slight change at Swinton. So we used to be, you're either a grouse keeper or a pheasant keeper. And we've now just sort of morphed everything in. So uh, Gary Taylor, who's our, who was our head grouse keeper, is now our head keeper. So he oversees all operations. I know other estates have done it um, 
I know Chris Blundell's done it and other ones around here, and I'm sure other shoots have done it. Um, and it just, just helps to have someone overseeing the whole the whole lot. And then you can use the, the beat um, the keepers sort of where, where they're needed. So that's the direct keepers for the employed. Uh, we have somebody else, sort of part-time helper. And then uh, as and when jobs are required, so obviously up in the moor, uh, when it's, it's burning time through the winter, if there's particular days when, when it's looking great, we'll, we'll get extras to come and help. And those quite often will be keepers' wives or, or other friends. And then, yeah, they, they, they'll also appear for shoot days, for picking up or flanking and beating. Um, yeah, so, gosh, I think on our, our sort of part-time, um, which is our sort of um, beaters role, there must be another 50 names of people we've got through that. Wow. Um, and then and then the other side of it is all the sort of the hospitality side. So um, people in the hotel who are looking after the, the, the shoot teams and the staying through the, through the restaurants. Uh, we do all our own uh, catering side of things. Um, so, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a lot, lot going on with it all, yeah. How does, so given how many people are involved in the estate and obviously how well known the estate is in the local area, presumably the village, it's not really a village, is it? It's more of a town, a town village, isn't it? Yeah, we like to call, Massim likes to call itself a town. It has a town hall, so I presume that must make it a town. I don't <laughs> but presumably the town would therefore be quite pro shooting, would you say, because of all the influence it might have? Yeah, no, 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 no. I think Massam is, is, uh, is, yeah, shooting goes down, going well. I mean, you always get, there might be a, a particular pub landlord or someone who's not so keen, but as a general rule, I think uh, we're all, yeah, they can see it's all part of the community and hopefully, yeah, we portray a, a good responsible uh, image, which is what we're all about, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you can get the shoot deeply associated with, the local community then you're on to a winner <laughs> for, for all of us <laughs> yeah yeah um so uh, we were having a quick look at the swinton website earlier um and i noticed something interesting that you have two types of pheasant day uh pheasants from premium coverts and pheasants from mixed coverts and I, I maybe it's a cheeky question can you explain to me the difference between those two days yeah so um so the premium covers so I mean, we've actually so we split up uh, the, the shoot on Swinton to three different shoots. So we have the home shoot, which we run, and then the premium covers will be sort of further up the valley towards the moor, and then mixed covers will be sort of some other drives that sort of more around the park and setting and things like that. And then we've also let out two areas. So we have an Ellington shoot uh, that we let out and a Nutbush shoot that we let out, and that they'll do a variation as well. Ellington shoot does quite a lot of partridge days and pheasant days, and then Nutbush shoot is, is a sort of just a bit more of a mixed mixed shoot so i mean it's, it's that's the lovely thing about swinton you've got a large variety of landscapes and, and valleys and various things so um yes yeah, so we, we try i mean i know things like whitfield who have their grading of sort of extreme and all those type of things so it's yes it's just to try and give teams if, if they want like we were talking earlier if you want the high bird challenge it's there but if, if that's not your bag then there's something a bit different have a go at yeah yeah no that makes sense and, and on a size in the state you've got absolutely yeah wh why wouldn't you uh offer a bit of variation so i've always wondered uh <clears throat> and i've not asked this on a pod before but if you own a shoot are you actually able to enjoy shooting on your own patch or do you, do you spend the whole day worrying about how the birds are flying and that kind of thing how's it how's it work for you um, I mean, I always find grouse days slightly more stressful than pheasant days, to be honest. Uh, grouse is just, just much more unpredictability. You just never quite know what's going to happen, where the bird's going to go. So generally, I find those days a bit more stressful to the hosting, trying to sort out. Um, shooting myself, uh, yeah, I, I, hopefully, well, once you're actually shooting, you, you get into it and you just forget about everything else and enjoy it for, for what it is. So. That that side of it is, yeah, no, I think I can, I can relax it up and enjoy that side. Uh, and, uh, do do yeah, you do, you do keep a few days back for the family and and that kind of thing? Do you? I I have a syndicate day. I have a syndicate on the grouse and on the pheasant. And I keep uh, keep an estate gun for that, and so yeah. Then we have sort of the Boxing Day sort of where all the family are out and things. So yeah, no, I tried. To, I've got two boys, seventeen and thirteen year old, and, and a daughter who's nineteen. Daughter's not not really taken to it, but. Two boys who get out as when I can, yeah. And talking of grouse, actually, I mean, presumably this year, obviously, you've, you've got two hats on here: Grouse Morola and, and and Moreland Association chairman. But this year was described by many as one of the worst year ever for grouse numbers. 
can you explain for our listeners' benefit maybe some of the nuances of that? What caused it, and 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 how it how we sort of ended up where we are? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll live through the uh, yeah the the, the lows. Sorry, um, we've had, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's no, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the, the, we've had quite a bad bout of heather beetle um, that seems to have gone through different regions at different times, but. Over the last sort of three years, that seems to have swept through pretty badly. Everyone normally has some heather beetle, but for whatever reason, climate change, something, it's, it's been a lot more extreme. So, whereas you might normally have about 5% of your more affected, as people have been having 50% of their more affected or something. So, that takes away a lot of the food source for the, for the, the growing up grouse. Uh, and then we just had some bad springs, so hatch time. So, in lockdown last year, it was lovely and sunny, but and very dry, which meant there wasn't much insect hatch. So the, the chicks, which hatch out and then live off insects for the first couple of months of their life, just had nothing to feed on. So you'd see broods hatching out, and just each day, there would another one would dwindle away. And so we had that problem. And then this year, we had just a very cold, wet weather in, in sort of mid-May again when they're hatching. So a lot just sort of died on the nest almost. So it, there's, there's just been... A poor year for hatching and, and some not very sort of healthy mature grouse. So yeah, so we, we just seem to have dipped into a bit of a layer. I mean, grouse. We we have a chart on our one of our huts up on the moor, and it shows this this, this very cyclical sort of five year cycle of highs and lows. And uh, we just seem to be in a bit of a lurk at the moment. So but I'm sure we'll, we'll bounce back and we'll be up there again. But I guess apart from the the challenge of, of shooting these very fast contour hugging birds, one of the things that makes grouse shooting special is the unpredictability of it, isn't it? It's the the fact that they are a truly wild bird uh, and all that sort of thing. So I guess it, it kind of comes with the territory, doesn't it? It does, and, and yeah, that that's the joy of them. But also, as I was referring to earlier, also the stress of a, someone owning and trying to run the shoot. You, you never quite that the unpredictability means you never quite know what you're going to get on the day. But when it when it all clicks and works, as and being up there, it's just amazing. But uh, yeah, you, you can, yeah, that, that's going back to the kind of the who, the true gentleman shot or whatever. I mean, it's, it's as long as you've got people who understand that, then you're okay. So if people come expecting a certain well, that, thing, and then they're just that, then then you trying to manage their expectations can be a bit tricky. It's always tricky if you're selling days for the price that grouse days go for to try and manage that. Yeah, I understand it. Versus you don't have you seen how much I've just paid, and I think. <laughs> That that I mean, inevitably, you're going to end up with difficulties there, aren't you? Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's. Uh, I mean, that's why we have a syndicate, and, and they take a long term view and help me through. So we do a mixture of syndicate and let days, and um, hopefully the, the two work together. But it it is always it's it's, it's wonderful when it works, but uh, yeah, frustrating when it doesn't like any of it. Just going back to the heather beetle point, I heard someone was telling me a while back um, that that. Um, it got so bad that there were people sitting on Scarborough Beach, uh, which I haven't done. Uh, but but, uh, but there was... I, I think I think you mean Scarbados, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were people down on the beach, and when there was a strong wind, the beetle were being blown off the top of the moor over the cliff down onto the beach in in large large numbers. Have you have you heard of this? I mean, that just sort of yeah. demonstrates the, the yeah. size of the problem, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it seems to be a weird one. It's sort of, but, but we just don't probably, there's, there's many things about grouse and the moorland that we're still sort of learning, and heather beetle is one of those. And yes, we, we have a, a, some reservoirs here, and we saw a massive load of heather beetle just, just all in the reservoir. And, and it looks as though there's a certain time of year they almost search out water or something. I don't quite know what it is um, in early spring, but uh, yeah, they, 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 they were there in their droves. And it was, as you say, yeah, incredible. Can you control heather beetle without harming anything else? I mean, we're looking at that in, through the Moreland Association, doing some research. And one of the things is, is trying to, um, there's a, a certain scent that heather gives off that attracts the heather beetle to it. And if you can replicate that scent and somehow set up a trap using that, that's great. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's also a sort of type of aphid that normally eats the heather beetle. And obviously that's got a bit out of sync. So whether you can help produce that aphid, um, that's uh, if you're a commercial crop farmer in Suffolk or something and get a, a load of pests, then that's the kind of thing you might go down. But it's all a bit of research. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the heather beetle has gone away naturally. So as ever, nature has probably come up with some of the answers that we needed. Do you need a really, really harsh winter then? Is that what would sort it? Because actually we didn't have that. It was just wet, wasn't it? The weather you're referring to. 
Yeah, so whether it's this migration, as you say, is weird. I suppose some have flocked to water or something. Um, as you say, we haven't had the, 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 the normally the cold winters you expect, which people say would would uh, kill off their people. So there's something else that's, that's probably happened. Yeah. So are we going to see moorlands with like looking like pub gardens where they've got all those wasp catchers everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> those yellow things knocking around, attracting what they don't want into the corners. Yeah, yeah, no, but possibly, yeah, yeah. We're, we're always up for trying out something. So, yeah. <laughs> well, if it sorts out the grouse numbers, I'm sure it'll sort of be tried by someone. <laughs> Uh, but Mark, I mean, listening to you talk about it and uh, talk about shooting in general and, and also having read an article, uh, I think it was in the Yorkshire Post, was an interview with you. Um, what st- really struck me is that you appear to have like a really deep kind of psychological, almost visceral connection with Swinton and its landscape and its wildlife. How important do you think growing up at Swinton has been for, for the direction that you've taken through life? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, gosh, it's, it's hard to answer that one. I mean, with um, growing up as to who I am, so if, if I'd grown up in a different way, I'm sure I'd be a different different person, really. But yeah, for me, it, it's been wonderful. I mean, I, I went away and worked away for a while, um, but a dream was always to come back to Swinton. I mean, I was lucky enough to to know at some stage I'd inherit the estate, so um, that was always there. Um, but part of what we've done is is to to buy back the old family home, set it up as a, as a hotel so that we could bring people in to come and enjoy all the various aspects of what Swinton has to offer and, and, and make sort of hopefully enough money out of it all to, to, to reinvest back in the estate and the buildings to, to, for it to, to see it all grow and, and work. So, yes, it's, it's, it's a huge part of, of yeah, me and uh, what I enjoy. So, yeah, I've been very lucky that that's, I suppose that's, that's where I've, I've grown up and yeah, enjoyed it all, yeah. You're sort of a, a custodian for the next generation, in a sense, then, of of, the, of of everything that the estate does and manages and so on. Yeah, very much so. And I, I don't really, look, uh, yes, I, I, I own the estate, but, um, but there's so many other players on the estate that are very key parts of it all that uh, hopefully we work as a team to, to, to as you say, to, to, to look after and keep it going for, for ourselves, for to all enjoy and for future people to enjoy. So, yeah, yeah. So... I've been dying to ask you about this, uh, and you probably know what I'm about to ask you. Um, <laughs> but with your keen conservation hat on, and obviously with your Moreland Association hat on, I know you've been involved in the Hen Harrier Brood Management Scheme, um, which is a fascinating project because it's it's so important for many, many different reasons, uh, not least sort of conservation, but then political and all sorts. Um and the, the whole point of the scheme, as I understand it, is to increase the number of hen harriers. Um, now, this should be central to everything that the RSPB would support, but they don't agree with it, right? Why is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, clearly um, the, the, the RSPB and uh, shooting, the, 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 we, the, we seem to be going slightly further apart rather than coming together, which is a real shame, I think. Um RSPB don't disagree with all of it. They, they disagree with the brood management side of it. And um, that, that's, they disagree that it's coming in too early. Uh, we, we, we've seen what happens and we're part of the scheme whereby hen harriers, even when they're at a very low ebb, um, that they will colonise certain areas uh, and therefore it's not like an even spread. And what's it actually involve? What, 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 what's, the, what's the scheme designed to do what you know for you on your estate what what needs to happen so so with brood management so you've got to have two nests within 10 kilometers of each other and then you're allowed to brood manage the second nest so you, you're you're leaving one natural nest to, to look after itself and to carry on and then you're brood managing the second nest which means it's taken away just after the chicks have hatched bred in captivity and re-released on a, um, a site in the same spa which is the special protection area um, so it's still released in in the general local geographic area, but not on your moor. So you're able to spread out the the, the colonisation of hen harriers, uh, which which seems a, a perfectly good and reasonable thing to just to make sure that they're spread in, in a larger area and um, colonise different parts. So I, I, I fail to see the the problem that, that the RSPB have with it. And and, and do the numbers? prove your point there as well absolutely so i mean it's it's, it's part of it is, is is the trial is also to see how people's feelings are towards hen harriers and, and, and 
uh, being part of that recovery project. And yes, it, just in the, in the last year, we had another record-breaking year of uh, sort of 24 nests. And out of those, about 19 of those are on areas actively managed for, for grouse. So the, the, the grouse shooting community is really taking this and working with it. Uh, and we're actually being the, the main part of it, whereas you have people uh, like RSVB who are just there trying to do legal challenges against against the success of what we're proving. It's really interesting. And it was really interesting what you mentioned about uh, not quite understanding why the RSPB aren't where we are on this. Um, and particularly because uh, I saw on Wednesday this week, I think it was, that Chris Packham was up at the, the COP event in Glasgow at, at some demonstration or another, uh, effectively saying that for the sake of the planet, the game shooting community should be standing with the RSPP to call for a greater protection for the environment. Um, if Chris Packham was on this recording with us now, what would you say to him? Um, so so the, the, the frustrating thing is all these debates happening in social media or in Parliament or away from the actual moor itself. So I feel that if we actually get people standing on a moor, having the active debate, looking around them at the environment that we've protected preserved and continue to look after there's so much good that you can just see around you that, that that's what's frustrating for us as, as land managers as keepers we've been out there doing these this job for decades centuries uh, and, and and we feel we've done a reasonable job there, there are clearly things like everybody can do there are things we can do better um, but we have not gone out and harmed the environment that people like to say so I mean if it'd been a massive commercial forestry or a sort of commercial sheep farm or anything else that previous ancestors of mine could have chosen to go down that route, that then we'd have had a real problem and they probably wouldn't be, well, I probably wouldn't be sitting in a national park or a protected area because, because of the work that the previous generations chose to do. But because of the, the work we've done on grouse more management, we, we came tops and, and, and we, we've been created national parks because, because people are proud of what the environment that we have around us. So it's hugely frustrating when, yes, there are things we haven't done right in the past and we need to improve. And we're looking to improve on those, and I think we're proving we are doing that. And that people just continue to attack us for, for actually unfounded things, which which is very frustrating. I'm I'm fast I'm fascinated to hear that. I mean, I knew from what I've read in the sporting press that results have gone well, but I'm really interested to hear about how you describe it. And obviously, it does require habitat for these hen harriers to 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 prevail. And and therefore you you pretty much can't have lots of hen harriers without lots of grouse knocking around and things like that. I just, I think that those two go hand in hand. I think that's fairly obvious. But what I'm interested to understand is how much of a difference to your grouse shoot do you think the presence of hen harriers that you now have, given the success you've been through, how much of a difference does it make? Um, so yeah, so I mean, just on your first point, I mean, you, you can have hen harriers and not have grouse. I mean, the, the hen harriers used to exist around all sorts of areas in the UK. I mean, they, they, they uh, I mean, they're called the hen harrier because they used to eat chickens, hens. I mean, they, they, they existed in various places. And part of the, the recovery program is to have a southern reintroduction program. So okay, I mean, you, you see the successful outcome of red kites going over various areas. Hen harriers can exist in other places, but um, because they're a ground nesting bird, we've seen that any ground nesting bird has, has found ever more than a haven because of our strong predator control. So, Indeed. Um, so that they, they, they've been restricted to that habitat more through how other habitats have sort of varied rather than necessarily that being the, the, the place that they would particularly choose to be. But yeah, we, we, we provide a good environment for them and, and we can we can do that and we can be welcoming and, and we can work together. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the story we, we were doing. But with the moor itself and the shooting, have you seen? Does it does it have much impact? To could it, you know, does having more hen harriers around mess up more drives, affect days that you sold that sort of stuff, or is it just manageable? Do people understand it now? It, 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 clearly, they have more impact. Yes, the, 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 and that's part of what the diversity feeding, the brood management, taken on board. So we had the Langham uh, work that was amazing that done in Scotland, and that proved that they yeah that they have an impact on an active grouse moor. So. Thankfully, the government with the recovery plan put in the brood management and the diversionary feeding, which, which helps mitigate that impact. And I think that that's, that's to show that, that we, we can carry on doing grouse shooting and have hen harriers with, with these mitigation measures in place. I think that's part of what we're doing. Very good. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I think it's all a little bit serious, though. Again, Chris, um, it, it is. You know what I'm like. I get suck, I get I get hung <laughs> up on some of these points because I'm passionate. But yes, lighten it up, George. <laughs> well, it's my function. Um, no, what I wanted to ask, <laughs> what I wanted to ask, Mark, is um, Swinton is obviously a very highly regarded shooting estate for grouse shooting, pheasant shooting, um, which means you must have had some pretty good shots come through over the years. Who would be the best that you've seen? Uh, and I, I'll let you have two categories. I'll let you have grouse and pheasant shots. Go on, name names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so we've seen seen a wide variety of people. I mean, yeah, going back to my uncle, who sadly by the end of the days, is, I, think, um, I have to sort of say enough's enough. But in his heyday, it was amazing. Uh, going back to your your comment about the shooting the low birds, uh, he, that was almost his forte, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, I just remember seeing him around the corner of a wood. Where he knew all the birds would curl around, and he was just there. And there was, there was no better person. To, everyone was a perfectly safe shot, but he he, he would make sure they were dead, and uh, that's almost a skill in itself. And just uh, yeah, he was incredible. And on grouse, he was just brilliant. So yes, he he didn't like the high pheasant very much, but uh, he was brilliant at everything else. In terms of the high pheasant, uh, we've had uh, Lord Peel, Willie Peel, uh, shooting me. I think he, he's a he's a fantastic shot. Uh, still is uh, Stephen Hopkins who rents the own to shoot off us yeah so you always think he's he's missed the bird or he's not done it and then he just shoots so late just as you think nothing's happened you know, he'll just pull it out of the sky so yeah there's a few a few people we've had here yeah there's a few names there's, there's plenty of others who I'm sure feel very offended that I've missed them off <laughs> <laughs> you'll get some messages later on um very good um so at the end of these podcasts, Mark, um, <clears throat> we, we have this section called Desert Island Shooting, for those that haven't listened to this before. Um, essentially, it's about one last day. Imagine that shooting's all ending tomorrow, doom and gloom, but we're going to go out with a bang. You've got to answer, answer where would it be? Uh, who would you have with you? What would you do? Give us some detail around it. What would make your ultimate last day shooting? Um, we've been referring to it probably a bit earlier. So really, um, it is just out there up on the moor, uh, on the moor edge, just going out and having an amazing walked up day. So you're there with your with your family, with your friends, the sort of keepers around you, the dogs are around you. Uh, you watch the dogs working. You just never know what's suddenly going to pop up in front of you, where it's going to come from, how it's going to go. And you're out actually taking some exercise. That's one of the things I always find a little bit by, by the end of my season, I've, I've, the, the weight's gone on. I've had some lovely shooting lunches and enjoyed myself, but perhaps a bit of exercise wasn't such a bad thing. So it's, um, and there, yeah, when you get to the end of the day and you can go and have a pint and you really know you've been out there, you've been challenged physically with your shots, just for everything you've seen. And it's just, uh, it's, so yeah, it's a, it's a great atmosphere. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very hard to beat. To, I mean, clearly the, 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 the highs you get, off you say before, off your, the most amazing high pheasant or just that that wonderful shot of a grouse and, and the atmosphere you're there when you're up on the moor. They're all they're all highs in their own way, but I think for a for a full day walked up with your family and friends, it's just hard to beat. So uh, so your your desert island shooting is in your own garden, which I like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I probably haven't got out enough is the, the short answer. <laughs> but I mean, it, what's really interesting, I mean, we were talking about the proper shooting person and you've got access to all this incredible shooting, incredible high bird shooting, amazing grouse moor, all the rest of it. But I think maybe this is what our definition of the, uh, you know, a true shooting person is, is actually somebody who finds as much pleasure in that very simple walked up experience as much as those, you know, slightly grander affairs. Um, so I think that's lovely. And I think it's fantastic how many people we've had on who've given, you know, variations on a theme, which is the thing that I grew up doing with my closest friends or with my family that's what I want to do for my last ever experience. I think that's a, it's a really telling thing about shooting as a whole. Absolutely, yeah. It's just it's a wonderful enjoyment for all sorts of, and that, that's the bit that's always hard to get across to people who are anti. It is it is a, a wide variety of people all having a good day out. It's not just toffs and tweeds, which uh, we always seem to come across as a bit 
And I think for those listening who have driven grouse and high pheasants as just the sort of ultimate shooting for them, uh, and I very much put myself in that category, <laughs> it's a nice reminder that someone who has all of that would go back to a walked up day <laughs> for their last <laughs> one. So basically, when, when it gets really, really good, you go back to walked up shooting. That's, I think, the moral of this story. <laughs> <laughs> or that actually it's all fantastic. It's just that some of it costs more to achieve. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Very good. Right. Well, Mark, that's been really interesting having you with us. Thank you ever so much for, for taking the time to, to record with us. It's been great. No problems at all. I very much enjoyed it. So no, thank you very much. Yeah, got to the end of my feast and so I probably need to move on now. Uh, we've, timed, we've timed these things well. We've got it down to a fine art now. So I've, <laughs> I've nearly finished mine as well. <laughs> good. Head, head down to the village, to the pub and have another. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. No problems. Thank you. Right. So before we go, as per usual, there is one final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas to resolve or by getting in touch to let us know where you've been listening. We haven't heard one of those for a little while, have we, Chris? Yeah, we want the top a top of a mast again. I like that one. I got yeah. reminded about that at the weekend. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, or by sending us your unpopular opinions. Uh, just send us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. Uh, and if we read it out in the next episode or any future episode, we will send you some garters. And in doing so, you will qualify uh, to maybe come on our Order of the Garter shoot day at Stockton in Wiltshire on the 31st of January next year. Um, again, if you, are, if you already have your garters and you want to come, act quickly. Pegs are going fast. Uh, drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. Uh, we will be back uh, at some point when, if maybe turns up or not, who knows. We'll be back at some point soon. But until then, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Having a baby is nowhere near as easy as they made you think at school. <laughs> <laughs>